Hello, this is David Kerr, and welcome back to Rappahannock Issues. We're on the road today, or at least we're talking about roads. We're talking about roads and transportation in general with Paul Mildy, who is the Applied Supervisor on the Staff Board of Supervisors. And uh, Paul, I was going to uh, ask you uh, one more question about the worst of the worst study, the hot points on the uh, I-95 uh, corridor between roughly Massapownix and going north of the Prince William uh, border. And that had to do with the 630 I-95 interchange. That's near the Stafford County Courthouse. Um, there was a lot of controversy around that at one point about its prioritization, the amount of funding, what we wanted, what the state gave us. Sure. Can you give me a little background on that and how, how it worked out? And are, are you satisfied with it? I, I am satisfied with it. Let me give you the background. I think it's from a political point of view, it's interesting. I hope it's, it is for others. When I was elected in 2005 and took office, office in 2006, there was a plan on the books from 1992 that guaranteed um, that the state would build, would improve that, improve, improve that interchange uh, as a condition of allowing the Center Parkway to have been built. But mm -hmm. nobody had done anything. So 92 to 2005, nothing had happened. Wow. I came on the board with some very strong transportation people. Mark Dudenheffer and I got elected mm -hmm. at the same time. Two years later, Cord Sterling came on the board, took over for Bob Gibbons. And the, between he was on the CTB. He was our uh, rep, one of the reps for the CTB, the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Three of us put a full court press on everyone we could think of, got the board to, to write letters to the state, got, got with our then Ch Senator Ch uh, Chichester and um, Bill Howe, and really started saying, look, we have, you have an obligation to us. And so we, we got a plan on the books a few years later to do a, two, a very nice, full-blown, cloverleaf type of, or at least partial cloverleaf type of interchange there. It was about a $200 million price tag. It was funded more in the out years than it was in the, in, mm -hmm. in the beginning, but we had land acquisition money in there. We started moving along, and then the current governor came in. He fired Ford Sterling prematurely off of the CTB, um, and then because of constraints, budget constraints, there was a reduction in the amount of money on capital improvement projects across the state, and we suffered a huge reduction. They, first, they stopped the project, and, and we started throwing a fit again and, and went to the press, and our governor... He's been effective, and he's also very sensitive to the press. He he started had our local VDOT contingent work with us and, and the Secretary of Transportation, and they came up with a new plan, a hundred and fifty million dollar plan, which is a divergent diamond. And you're going to you're going to remember it when you see it when it gets built <laughs> twenty in twenty 2020 twenty or twenty twenty one when it's finished because it will be finished now. It's we're well underway. We've done land acquisition completely. You'll notice that that extremely high price Sunoco that mm -hmm. used to charge a dollar more a gallon in gas is gone. Uh, as a result of land acquisition, not because they were gouging people. And the gas station... That's across, a nice side benefit. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, I felt bad for travelers thinking Stafford had these ridiculous... Uh, no one from here would buy their gas there. Any, anyway, so we are now moving forward with this new concept, which I think w I will work. There's a, a lot of people complain that it doesn't have the... Uh, that doesn't, in the out years, the capacity, it can have a capacity problem, a divergent diamond. What that means is you will cross the, the highway if you're traveling east on the left side and vice versa, you will you will switch over to the what you think of as the wrong side of the road and then back over to the what you think of as the right side of the road as you cross the highway. That is what a divergent diamond does. But it, it's a, uh -huh. it'll change everything. It'll be a half of a mile further south. It will connect with Hospital Boulevard instead of Courthouse Road, and you will have to kind of do a little jig, you know, a little L. Um, to get back to Courthouse Road, and then the what we the original Courthouse Road that goes uh, over 95 now will be shut down. So where the McDonald's is, that will be gone. And where that new car wash is, will be a dead end. Um, and you'll 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 come a different way from points uh, points east. But it's happening. Well, that, that, and I appreciate the background mm -hmm. on that because I didn't realize it was went back so far, mm -hmm. and there's been quite as much drama about it. One thing I picked up in our conversation, uh, which I, I think a lot of people don't realize about transportation is just how much interaction there is. You, you, you speak of talking about working with Bill Howell, other members of the, of the delegation to the, to the Richmond, uh, state senators, the federal government, the state government. Uh, this is a tremendously complicated dance. Yeah, they have the money. So you well, have, they, I, not much of it, but they have some money. <laughs> and so this. It takes quite an orchestration for somebody at the Stafford County level to really know what's going on, where the sources are, 
who needs to be talked to, who needs to be lobbied, who needs to be lobbied to lobby somebody else. Sure. That's uh, right. And uh, it sounds like staffers have been fairly effective at that. We've done, we have done a good job in the last 10 years of getting funding. And again, it started with Cord Sterling on the Commonwealth Transportation Board was masterful with getting what looked like a disproportionate amount of funding. He would argue that it was just catching up, that Northern Virginia was getting their fair share and we hadn't been, and I think he's right. But if you start looking at all the projects, the Falmouth Interchange, the 17 improvements, the Courthouse Road improvements, the express lane extension now, two more miles, not to mention the express lanes to begin with, mm -hmm. they were going to stop at 234, right past 234. That was getting them extended all the way to Garrisonville Road was a big deal. Now, it, cr it created a traffic problem for us, but it was, the, it was the logical next step to come all the way to 610 with the express lanes. But I'm just naming, I just named a few. Uh, now, the ones we just talked about, another, another $1.4 billion in improvements that are going to happen and are supposed to happen by, 20, really by 2021, 2022. We think we are being treated more fairly uh, than we ever had. Been. Well, and uh, in the world of transportation, uh, that's like tomorrow. <laughs> in the world of politics, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that, that too. Well, uh, just one comment about, about the express lanes. Um, I hope I don't sound like Donald Trump with this, but I've heard people say mm -hmm. that uh, uh, it can be a bit expensive. Yes, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But, well, you said it. Yeah, it's ridiculous, but I think it, excuse me, it may be the cost of getting these improvements. If you play with the numbers long enough, these are 60 and 70 year concession agreements. And, you, and they'll tell you, you'll, you'll see a report occasionally about the revenue being generated from these, uh, the however many thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a week. And you do the math, these aren't huge returns that these investors are making. And they're doing it, they're gambling, because you know, other improvements can happen, economies can change, traffic flows can change. They take a gamble that, that there'll be a need for this, uh, and these, these express lanes in this case, for the next 50 or 60 years. So I'm not so sure they're, they're not charging us any much more than it actually costs to build the improvement. It's a true user fee, but more importantly, you still can get HOV three. If you want, if you want to get on the express lanes and ride free, all you have to do is grab a few more people and figure out how to be more efficient in your commuting. And a motorcycle, of course. I think you're getting a three wheeled motorcycle. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's bad. <laughs> two in the front or two in the back? I'm just curious because <laughs> I see these now, now. These new ones in Europe. Uh, two of the, uh, the two. Well, they, they both look whatever. It, person my age can drive safely. I think they're, I think you're good either way. Um, and then um, I, have a, I have a motorcycle license, but I haven't owned a motorcycle in quite a while. That's probably why you're still alive. Yeah, I, that's right. And then also the other thing about the express lanes is there's no question that even though maybe you don't want to pay that $17 coming home, it does help you. It does minimize congestion or, or reduce congestion on the lanes that, you, that are not pay lanes. The big problems we see on a Thursday or a Friday heading south on 95 at uh, at six before six ten are really a result of the of the merge. If those lanes are extended all the way to the Rappahannock River and south, and they will be, you are going to see improved flow in both sides, not just the two. So that, those these things work, but that merge was the problem, and that's going to be a problem until you get it all the way past south of Massapequa. Well, this is one of the few conversations we've had on Rappahannock issues about transportation that is even remotely optimistic. And so with that, we're going to talk about some more optimistic stuff on the next uh, section. So please uh, stay with us and uh, back to the break.